All right, welcome ladies and gentlemen, creatives of all ages. We are here at the Maxon booth at NAB 2022, day three. We have made it this far. I thought we would be under complete exhaustion, but I think the excitement of being able to get together and show all of our creative work is picking us up over the jet lag, alcohol, and everything else that Vegas throws at us. So, we are here with some of the most amazing artists showcasing how they use Max on One products in their workflow to create stunning imagery and things that just blow our mind and inspire us as creatives. So I'm going to introduce you to my left is Jacob Dalton, an amazing artist. And I'm not going to say anything because you're going to see what happens next. So stay tuned, internet, ask all the questions, and we will see you in about an hour. All righty. Thank you, Matthias. All righty. So uh, as he mentioned, my name is Jacob Dalton. I uh, am a 26-year-old freelance VFX artist, and today I'm going to be talking to you uh, about a presentation I call Corner Cutting VFX. Um, now, what I mean by that is, you know how sometimes you don't necessarily have the optimal amount of time to do something the perfect way you'd like to do it, but you still got to make sure it looks cool, uh, and you got to get it done in time. So sometimes you kind of use little tricks to uh, get yourself to the finish line, make sure your clients are happy. So uh, yeah, I uh, will tell you a little bit more about myself, then I'll play my reel. Like I said, I uh, am a freelance artist. I am uh, organ located at the moment. I've been doing this for maybe close to a decade or so since I was 16, and I could make terrible commercials for any local business. Um, I uh, spent the last handful of years working for a company called Video Copilot, which was really fun. Um, the reason I bring that up is because while I was there, I got to work on a project uh, for THX which was cool, there's a like, camera fly through, and that was my first foray into Cinema 4D and Redshift in general. Uh, and since then, I've kind of found my home, and this is my software of choice. So, uh, you know, tell your friends. I uh, am going to uh, play my reel, and then we can get right into it. Thank you guys, but lots of fun. Um, I like to work a lot in eSports. I don't know, you may have seen some projects in there for a game called Rocket League. That was a lot of fun. Uh, if you want to add me, come hit me up after the show. But uh, I uh, work a lot with a studio called Paper Crowns, which these guys are pretty cool. I just want to throw up a quick slide shout out. Um, I do a lot of the eSports projects through them. So you may have seen companies like Power, 100 Thieves pop up. Uh, but one thing that I'm going to be using for my first couple examples today uh, is a project I did with my dear friend Josiah. Another quick shout out. Yeah, he's a director in over in upstate New York. He's always coming up with wacky, cool, stylized ideas. One of which was a mock trailer for like a Knights of Ren. I don't know if it was supposed to be a show or a movie, but the idea was just to pull off some fun VFX. Um, there were a couple clips in my reel, but because it's going to be the source of my first two examples today, uh, I'd love to... Uh, show off what we made, if you'll indulge me real quick. That was kind of a, a fun little goofy fan film we threw together last year. Um, 
you know, it, it might be uh, bringing up some questions like, you know, I was just talking about corner cutting to make clients happy and uh, why is that relevant with a personal fan film? Um, but let me tell you, there's only a handful of scenarios where you're allowed to leave both your kids with your wife to make your Star Wars fan film with your friend. So we had to be efficient and we had to corner cut a little bit. Um, I have some fun clips of kind of what those shots looked like. A lot of it was compositing. Uh, this is in Josiah's backyard. That's his brother Johnny in the cardboard mask jumping off the trampoline. Um, and yeah, we kind of just saw how far we could push footage into looking kind of neat. So uh, my first example is going to be talking about uh, taking some 3D camera track data from After Effects, bringing it into Cinema 4D, and uh, how you might use that to add 3D objects to your scene or set up a set extension. Uh, right after that, we're going to be popping on back to After Effects, where we're going to be talking about taking a static character. This is something without camera movement. Uh, and we're going to be bringing our character into an existing 3D scene and adding some additional camera motion to him to make him more interesting. So uh, without any further ado, let's go ahead and pop right on over into After Effects, where I have my raw footage imported. Um, this shot, I know from experience, is going to track quite nicely if you've done this before. Lots of great details. It's very simple. After Effects like shots like this where we kind of just slide forward. So uh, I'm going to click my shot. I'm going to add the 3D camera tracker effect to it. And this is going to take just a minute to initialize. Look, I have two on there. No worries. It's OK. Uh, but instead of making you wait with the power of movie magic, we can pop over to our second comp where it's finished. Woohoo! OK. Um, we have our shot tracked. And if you're not familiar with the 3D camera tracker, when it finishes, we get a lot of these points here on the ground. And uh, one thing I like to do before we go anywhere outside of After Effects is add a couple reference uh, solids, or nulls if you would prefer, but I like the solids. And uh, I do that by clicking and dragging, just grabbing a bunch of points. And that's going to give us the average of those points. We can right click and say Create Solid. And uh, let's scale this up since uh, the scene is a little bit big and it's coming in small. OK. And uh, you can notice tracked pretty well. It's stuck to our ground. So I've gone ahead and I've already added a few for us, ones I know that I'll like to see in cinema. And uh, that's going to be our floor plane right here at the front, uh, the beginning of the slope, and then the tip over here. So these are going to be very handy reference points for when we're adding uh, additional geometry and assets to our scene. So in order to get this over into Cinema 4D, it's actually quite easy, fortunately. Because we can come over here and hit File, go to Export, and there's a whole function called the Maxon Cinema 4D Exporter. So we can select that, and it's going to take just a moment here. And uh, depending upon how long it takes, I'll have a moment to try out that joke I was thinking about. OK. So um, I'm just kidding. No, there was no joke. This was supposed to be finished by now. Don't worry about it. We're doing it live. Does anybody else know any jokes? What is going on? OK, we have a, a warning that pops up. And this pops up almost every time you use this function to export out from After Effects to Cinema 4D. And it's just letting us know that there are 2D layers in our comp that won't be brought over. Uh, that's very normal. We can go ahead and click OK. And uh, it's going to ask us to save this in a location. And it's giving it the name automatically of our composition. Notice O2 camera track, O2 camera track. So I like to leave that as is. And instead of waiting again, you'll notice I already saved it. So I'll just hit Cancel. Um, the 2D layer it didn't bring over was our footage, as I had mentioned. Um, so we're going to need to do that manually if we want to see our footage in Cinema 4D. Cinema 4D likes image sequences. So let's just go ahead and take our footage out as a PNG sequence. Um, so uh, obviously, if you're looking closely, you can tell it's already a PNG sequence. But suspension of disbelief, it's footage. We're going to solo this so we don't have our solids anymore. Quick shortcut if you uh, are an After Effects user. I like this one a lot. Control M. We're in the render queue. Woohoo! Change it to high quality. And uh, sorry, click high quality. And we're going to change this to PNG sequence. Press OK. We need to specify where we're outputting this to. Um, but the common theme here is that I have already done this. And we can go over into our first project. Uh, what's very cool about this, as I had mentioned before, if I'll show you it just creates a already prepared Cinema 4D project. So when you open that up, we've saved a lot of time because our Cinema 4D scene is the correct length. Uh, if you look in the project settings over here, it's already the correct frames per second. Um, if we go to our render settings, it's already the correct resolution. And it has the correct output frame rate. 
And if you're a Cinema 4D user, you'll notice that sometimes, uh, I don't know about you guys, I might forget to change the output frame rate, and I'll just change the project frame rate, and that can get you in trouble. It's all taken care of for you. You just got to use that exporter. So we have our scene here. And as you can see, our camera is tracked, and we've got our planes in here. Um, but we got one issue. If we exit our camera view and uh, zoom out here real quick, our camera is shooting directly into the ground. And that's going to make it very hard for us to place assets. So if we look back through our camera here and I say, OK, I'm going to take this cube, which I'm going to pretend is a cool rock. And I want my cool rock in my scene. I'm going to need to line it up with my floor. And uh, OK, we're going to uh, drag this. And uh, you know, it is too hard. Let's normalize our scene. That's the first tip. Uh, I'm going to back out of our camera. And the quick way I like to do this is to grab the spot where I want my scene to be uh, centered around, where I want to be my zero point. And in this case, it's going to be my floor plane, which happens to be this solid. So with this selected, I'm going to hold Shift and create, oh, my bad. Uh, there's a null button up here. It used to be in with, with these, but now there's a null button at the top. So hold Shift and select a new null. Holding Shift is going to make that null a child of the plane, which you'll notice uh, placed it right in the center of our plane. So if we drag this null outside so it's no longer a child of anybody, it is still in the right spot in world position. And if you click coordinates, you'll notice that all of this transferred over. So it's sort of a two-button solution to copying and pasting coordinates to put this at the right spot. I'm going to rename my null really quick to scene. And I'm going to take my uh, Knights of Ren scene here at the top, and I'm going to drag it in. And now it is a child of our new null. And our new null, we can zero this out. So uh, let's see, 0, comma, 0, comma, 0. Um, rotation, I know one of these needs to be 90 degrees or negative 90. Because look, at, you know, our camera is pointing right up. So we'll go negative 90. And uh, why don't we go ahead and zero out the scale as well? So uh, it doesn't look like we've done much, but if we uh, look back through our camera and we think about wanting to place an asset in our scene, for example, our cube rock placeholder again, there it is. It's right on the floor. We can drag it around. Everything's been normalized. And this is going to save us a lot of time as we're bringing in like, maybe some like, Quixel assets or stuff that we found on CG Trader. So um, next, we need to put in our footage. So to do that, I'm going to set up a material sequence for our footage. So I'm going to click this button right here. It's going to swing open our material window window, double click, and there's a new material. I'm going to double click our new material to bring open this little dialog. Uh, we don't need reflectance. I don't know if that matters, but I always uncheck it. And uh, we're going to put our image sequence into the color. So you'll notice there's an empty texture slot. I'm going to click this little folder icon, and then we're going to come over here to where I uh, placed my stuff. And uh, let's see. This was in here. Uh, this was in here. Hmm. All right. There's our first image of our sequence that was exported. Uh, we're going to click Open, and it's going to ask us, hey, do you want to take that image and copy it to a text folder at the project location? Um, in this instance, I want to say no. Sometimes that's helpful, but we want to leave the first image that we selected in the location with all of the other ones. So that way, later, when we try and turn this into a sequence, Cinema knows where they are. So I'll hit no. Uh, select the path. That's going to toggle open some settings. There's an animation tab up here at the top. And uh, our movie frame rate is already set to 24, which is another handy symptom of using the exporter out of uh, After Effects, because all of this got copied over. Usually, this is defaulted to 30, which is cool. So we're going to click this Calculate button. And we know it worked when a new movie end frame rate popped in there. It said, all right, we found all your frames. There are 353 of them. Uh, and before we close out of this dialog, there's a, a couple more buttons we need to push. I'm going to go to my Viewport tab down here. And we need to check on Animate Preview. And uh, I also like to uh, change my texture preview size to 2K. And uh, that's just going to keep things looking nice. So we've done it. We've got our material. But we need this as our Viewport background. So uh, fortunately, Cinema 4D already has uh, a nice function for that, which um, I uh, am in the newest version. Excuse me. What folder is this in now? Uh, background. OK. This is, the, this is the new icon. I'm in uh, R26, so we're still getting the UI figured out. But uh, if you click and hover on this, there's a whole background object. We can select that. 
and we're going to apply our material directly to it, and ta-da! Everything from After Effects has been brought over, and we're ready to start building out our scene. Uh, so this is where the fun part comes in. A uh, few buttons clicked, and we're ready to add stuff in here. So uh, the first thing I do when I'm doing a, a set extension is I'll uh, usually do a layout first with some primitives before I worry about bringing any assets. So for example, I'll uh, click on this cube and hold to bring open a bunch of other options of primitives, and I'll grab something like a landscape. And then, OK, I'll scale this, scale this up, and uh, maybe I'll exit my camera view and use this option here. It's the top of these two dots to hide, two clicks to turn it red, to hide our background so we're less distracted. And maybe I can slide this over. Oops, excuse me. Uh, I'll slide over my new primitive of a landscape, scale this guy up some. And uh, you know, you could maybe line this up, see we had the slope of our hill. And uh, maybe we'll make another one by holding control and dragging. And uh, I'm not going to make you watch me build out a whole scene, but just for example, if we look back through our camera here and we uh, unhide our background, you can kind of see we have some objects now placed in our scene that are lining up quite nicely. So uh, after you've got everything laid out, what I might do is throw an HDRI in here, um, render a low quality playbast. Uh, and uh, if you check it out, this was what I originally laid out from uh, the, uh, the final video. So these are just a bunch of landscape primitives. And uh, this model here, the X-Wing, was from Video Copilot. It was the free one in that pack. I just downloaded it and dismantled it and threw it in my scene. And it ended up looking kind of neat. Um, and uh, yeah, the final shot ended up turning out kind of neat. As I put like a like a <laughs> X-wing fighter pilot helmet in there. There's lots of cool materials. Redshift. It's a lot of fun to play with. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about our next example, which is going to be dealing with this uh, piece of footage here. Uh, what is this? Uh, Comp four. Here's my Rye footage. Very cool. Very high tech. This was this this setup was I think it was like somewhere in the realm of like a million dollars or like twenty, um, but he jumps off the trampoline and he lands on the crash pad and our camera's not moving at all, uh, and we want to make this a lot more interesting because if you remember in the final I had him jumping from a Tie Fighter over to an X Wing, um, which is like so like so realistic. If you any guys physics guys, no worry about it. Um, okay. Uh, what I want to do first is I'm going to chop him out. I, I don't want any of this background stuff. And fortunately, it was a very blue day. And he's got a very, very nice amount of contrast against the sky. So uh, I might grab uh, a mask. And uh, we'll, oh, you know, shape layers, watch out. Uh, we're going to draw a mask and uh, hit M to bring up the mask path. And then if we scrub through here, we can sort of just animate where this is so he's kind of locked in frame. Uh, and then you can use a uh, quick uh, plug for Primac here inside of uh, After Effects. It's a Red Giant plugin. Very cool. Love this one. So I'm going to throw out Primac here. And uh, we can click this button here. And this is going to allow us to select our color. And unlike Key Light, where you select one color, uh, we can actually select a gradient with Primac here. So maybe I'll click down here in the uh, light area, hold, and drag up to the top, and let go. And uh, it did a pretty good job already. Um, the good news is, instead of waiting for anything to load, uh, and no surprise to anybody who's been watching, uh, I already have it done. So, woohoo, there he is, he's cut out. We need to bring him out of After Effects and into Cinema 4D. Uh, the way to do that, again, Control M, we're in the render queue. Uh, we want him to be an image sequence, again, because uh, Cinema likes image sequences. And I'm only showing you this a second time to show you that if you have a, a, a piece of footage or something with an alpha channel, uh, you need to manually click the uh, channels, change it from RGB to RGB plus alpha in order to uh, carry this alpha channel over when we export. So OK, specify where you want it. And uh, then we can pop on over into Cinema 4D. Now, I've got this project already open here. There's a, a TIE Fighter and an X-Wing model. And uh, these are just going to be used as reference for how we animate this camera, because again, we're trying to add more life to this static shot. Uh, but unfortunately, we uh, didn't have all of our settings carry over from After Effects because we manually set this project up. So what you're going to want to do is hit Control D. That's going to pop open your project panel. And I'm going to change the uh, frames per second, which is defaulted to 30, down to 24. 
And uh, now we've got 72 frames, which uh, fortunately happens to be the exact length of uh, this composition. If you control click this, you can see the number of frames. Um, so uh, this is all working out. This is great. Uh, I was very lucky. I didn't plan that. We got 72 frames in here, and we want to bring in our character. So same as before with the background, we wanted to uh, uh, create a new material and apply that image sequence. Uh, fortunately, I've already done this. The only extra step that I'm skipping by having this set up is that because this has an alpha channel, uh, we need to check alpha down here, which is uh, towards the bottom of the list, and just bring him in a second time. So again, yeah, you click the first one, click calculate, 24 frames per second. All right. So uh, I want to assign this guy to a plane in my scene. So we're going to click and drag on this cube, create a plane and I'm going to apply my material to it. And uh, let me turn off my TIE Fighter really quick. Oh, quick handy tip. I like this one a lot. Um, most of the time when I hide something in my Cinema 4D scene, I, I want it to be hidden in my render too, not just the scene. So if you hold Alt when you're clicking one of these dots, it'll actually change both. So they're both green. Now they're both red, and he's gone. Um, OK, so we have our uh, character assigned to our plane here. And you'll notice he's lost a bunch of weight. It's no sweat. Uh, we can just uh, bring that back by scaling this up. But um, you know, if, especially if he's a character and not a texture, we don't want to just guess. We want that to be the right aspect ratio. And uh, the quick and uh, sort of cheap way I like to do that is select the plane, go to the Object tab where we can change the size. And I like to set the width and height to just the resolution of the footage. So for most cases, that might be something like 1920 by 1080. Um, this was widescreen, so I happen to know off the top of my head it was 2554 by 1080. And uh, there he is. He's the correct size and aspect ratio again. Um, however, our plane is obviously huge, so I'll just preemptively scale this down, but we're going to need to fine tune this later. Um, the next thing I want to do is link him to my camera. So let's make a camera first. Um, I'm just going to click this button here, the camera, to make a camera from view. And I'm going to select this button, so now we're looking through it. And if we fly around our scene, we're taking our camera with us. I'm going to take my plane and drag it up to be a child of my camera. And uh, we're going to zero out some of these coordinates. So uh, I want zero on the x and y, because that's the left and uh, right uh, up and down movement. Uh, but I'm going to leave the z the same for now. Uh, update your Myriad Pro regular. Um, at, actually, we activated that. Just you know, I thought that was important for you guys to know. OK, so uh, we have uh, 0 on the H. Uh, I think the P from uh, experience needs to be uh, 90 degrees. I was correct. And uh, 0 here. So uh, let's uh, move the Z so it sort of lines up with the edges of our frames. And uh, OK, if we fly this camera around, he looks like he's just uh, overlaid. On our, uh, on our scene. It doesn't look like he's in 3D space. But the cool thing is, is uh, if I unhide my TIE Fighter and I come over here to our starting position, he'll actually clip through the geometry. Um, so what I want to do is find our starting position. Uh, I think he might be a little bit big. So I'm going to scale him down some. And then I'm going to shift him forward closer to the camera. I'm going to fly my camera closer. And uh, maybe still a little big. OK. This will be our starting position. I don't want his feet clipping, but I do want him just like right like he's just jumped off of the TIE Fighter. Uh, I'm going to select my camera, and I'm going to make keyframes for the X, Y, and Z position and rotation. And we're going to jump forward to the end of our sequence here, frame 72. And uh, I'm going to fly my camera back and uh, try and make this perspective feel right. He's obviously bigger in the frame, but that's OK. We can kind of cheat this. Uh, something like this looks right. Maybe he's the right size compared to this uh, X-Wing. New keyframes, so uh, click these buttons again. And uh, real quick before we uh, preview this, I want to right-click my camera and choose uh, Show F-Curves. We could also go to the Animation tab, but uh, that's not too big of a deal. It looks like this is docked down here, and the Cintiq is blocking me. But we essentially just want to click this button to make our keyframes linear, uh, so that way our camera doesn't uh, ease in and ease out. Um, but OK. So if we play this back, you can see where are our camera keyframes? OK. Hold on. There's our camera. Uh, where'd the keyframes go? I want to be in the F curve. 
There we go. All right. Uh, I'm going to select my keyframes. We did not successfully make them linear, so now we're going to do it. It's this button right here, top middle, linear. All right. So now our camera is not going to ease out of that position and back in. It's just going to be the same speed the whole time. So if we play this back, kind of looks like our guy is uh, jumping between these two ships, which is cool because we also have this plane here which we won't want to render into our final composition, uh, but we will uh, use the position in 3D space uh, for compositing later in After Effects, which will be super handy. However, this camera is like entirely uninteresting. We don't like it being so static, uh, but we also don't want to mess with um, the link between our character, which is actually in 3D space, and our camera's movement and speed, because we already like the perspective and where he's at. So uh, we're just going to create another camera, Camera one, we're going to look through this one. We're going to make it a child of the original. So if we scrub through, it looks like we've changed nothing, except now we can fly this around. So uh, I'm going to zoom in here. Maybe we'll start up close. We'll create some keyframes for position and rotation. We'll go to the end here. And uh, maybe we'll, be, we'll zoom way far out, something like, something like this. Maybe we'll add like a little Dutch angle. That could be kind of cool. And uh, let's see. How's this look? If we go back to the beginning, hit play. Oh, man, our camera's got so much energy. It's, I don't know, is it worse? But it's cool. We can do a lot with this. The only thing you've got to be sure not to do is get too side on, because then you can tell he's a plane. We kind of want to stay looking directly at his front. And uh, yeah, so just a fun way to add some extra motion to your guy. Um, the cool thing is once you have your camera uh, animated and you know, okay, I like how this moves, you can start rendering different layers out. So for example, I just did this like VD, VDB cloud pass from the same perspective. And so once it's all comped together, you know, with some cool red giant stuff, uh, it ended up looking something like this, um, which it's like, okay, is this very cheesy? Like for sure, but it, it looks kind of fun, I guess, in my opinion. So uh, yeah, that was a really cool project. I had a lot of fun with it and we can move on into our next example. Uh, let's see. Where were we at? Uh, oh, okay, cool. So this was another really fun one, and this was another kind of um, wanting to do it quick type idea. I wanted it to uh, be something that we could just get through fast. It was a, a project that had some monsters in it. So I'll just show you some of the effects. I just have a little breakdown uh, here, and uh, then we can uh, talk about the uh, first example. Coming in the windows. Careful, look out. All right. Uh, I'm going to just stop it there just because the main thing I wanted to talk about was this, uh, this leg. Um, any of you who are into VFX know that uh, sometimes doing this type of like geometry type tracking, especially in a chaotic scene, is very challenging. There's software out there that can do a really good job of it. Uh, however, instead of uh, you know, spending some money and learning an entire new piece of software, uh, we wanted to get this shot done a little bit quickly. And it only has to look good from this one perspective. It just has to look like the tentacles on his leg. We didn't actually have to like injure our actor. So uh, I'll show you how I set that up really quick. And then I'll talk about some spline dynamics as well, uh, just because I think those are kind of fun. And uh, then we can keep on rolling. So I've got my project here in the uh, scene. I've got this boot model. I found this on CG Trader. It was free. Uh, I did not find a left leg. I had to download the whole guy. Uh, and uh, I had to take his left leg off. So if you see a model on CG Trader that's missing his leg, that was me. Um, we have our background already set up, and we already have our camera tracked. See, this is all tying together. We did those in the first couple examples. So our background has our character, I'll just hide our boot real quick, being pulled by a rope, and he's sort of flying off screen. So what I want to do is go to the first frame and take my boot and I'm just going to line it up with his leg here. So uh, I don't know how well you can see it. The shot's a little bit dark, but I'm not going to worry about being perfect. We'll just get this close. And uh, because I'm going to be keyframing every position in rotation every time, instead of clicking and dragging on all of these, I can just click this button, and it'll just create a keyframe for everything. So that'll save us some time. And uh, when we go through this and we line up this leg to our actor, um, we don't want to go frame by frame. 
I'm not a, an expert character animator, but I do know that one of the first things you want to do is hit your big poses. So I'm just going to jump forward a little bit to when his leg is in a very different position, maybe eight, because it's down on the ground now. So I'm just going to reorient this down, rotate it towards myself, because I can kind of see that's how his leg is, put it in place, and uh, we're moving. And I think this in the final shot ended up taking me probably about 30 minutes or so to do, because uh, you know, I was getting real close to my screen, like trying to make sure that the boot at least roughly matched the silhouette of his leg. Um, so I'm just going to go through the shot very loosely, uh, just so we have a moving leg to talk about spline dynamics with. So uh, I'll put him over here. That looks pretty neat. Um, oh, I just told you. You can click this button. Uh, OK. We'll come down here. Looks like his leg is back down again. Down. Back in Z space. Or Y space, I guess, because uh, the leg's reoriented. Uh, and we'll go to like frame 40, and we'll say, OK, uh, he's gone. He's all the way down the hallway. Goodbye. There's no saving him now. Um, OK. So after you've matched your big poses, um, you can go back through and add some between frames. I won't take too much time to do any of that, but say, for example, between 8 and 16, you can see his leg moved quicker. So I might just like go halfway, reorient this, add new a keyframe, and move on. So we got our big poses, and then we got our in-between poses. And then you might, at the very end, open up the F curve and adjust some speed ramp so that way it sort of starts feeling like it's flowing nicely. But uh, anyway, we're cutting corners. That's what we were talking about. I got my boot, and we want to add a tentacle to this. So uh, how might we do that? Uh, I'm going to leave my camera track view and hide my background. And uh, if you see, I'm just sort of uh, flying along. It's very chaotic. Looks fun. I want to draw a spline that's wrapping around this. And uh, anybody who's used the spline tool knows that Sometimes it's uh, a bit notor notoriously challenging. Let's see, where's the new spline tool? Is it here? It is. It could look like we're drawing like around our boot here, right? But if we reorient, it's sort of in a different spot than we expected it to be. So one thing I like to do, and again, we're back looking for uh, where UI got moved to. Um, hmm. Anybody see the snap tool in S26? Top middle, hey, thank you very much, sir. OK, we're going to enable snapping. So if we zoom in here, we're now able to click directly on vertices uh, on our boot. So I'm going to say our tentacle starts here. Maybe it comes up over the top, up underneath here, around the side. Maybe we'll wrap around the boot one more time. And uh, we can end right, right here. Why not? Um, obviously, if we wanted this to be really smooth and not jaggedy, we might want to add some more points. But for now, this is going to be fine. Uh, I do want to add one more point, though, which is where he's being pulled off to. Here. That's fine. Uh, we're going to be adding our dynamics pretty much just right between those two final points. So we need subdivisions. So in order to do that, we're going to select we're gonna, uh, uncheck snapping. I'm going to select this one, hold Shift, and select this one. And then I'm going to use this keyboard shortcut US, which is going to subdivide that. So if we do this a handful of times, you can notice we have more points popping up between. So that's going to help make this look more noodly. Uh, what we also want to do is put a null over here in 3D space to connect this endpoint to. So I'm going to make a new null. And uh, let's go ahead and just uh, slide this null over. Uh, the good news is this doesn't have to be perfectly in the right spot just as long as it's somewhat close. OK. What we want to do now is link this endpoint to our null. So in order to do that, I'm going to right click my spline. I'm going to go to hair tags. And we're going to choose, uh, let's see, where did we put this? Um, maybe it's under simulation tags now? Did they call it a connector? Or no, maybe a rope belt? I'm going to go with rope belt. I apologize. I'm sorry, guys. I'm in R26. I'm, I'm figuring this out on the fly. So OK, we got our rope belt here. We got our endpoint selected. I'm going to drag my null into the object here. And I'm going to click Set. And you're going to realize that it worked when it draws these connections. So let's do that over here on this other side to the boot as well. Uh, I'm going to grab my rectangle selection tool, grab all of these points, 
right click. We're going to go to uh, simulation tags, rope belt again. This time we're going to drag our boot in there and we're going to hit set. And last but not least, right click. We're going to go to uh, simulation tags one final time. And I think we just want to set it to rope, I'm assuming. And uh, if we hit play, no, that didn't connect. Why didn't it connect? That's confusing. OK. Well, I probably should have opened this up in R25, but no sweat. Usually this might work. But we got more examples, fortunately. I think I have one in here that actually works. So maybe I could just show you what it looks like, talk about the spline wrap, and move on, rather than troubleshooting with a live audience. No? Is that OK? Is that cool? <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see. We got our object here. This one's the original. Let's open that up. Uh, this is what my uh, tentacle looked like on my guy here. Uh, you'll notice that the spline wrap is like delayed by a frame, but if you ever pause it, it sort of just hops back to where it needs to be. So the way a spline wrap works, and I'll just show you, is if you make a spline, and it could look like anything, and you take a model, say a cylinder in this case, excuse me, not trying to draw a new spline, uh, if you take a cylinder, in this case, I'm going to make the cylinder nice and tall. And we're going to add some more segments, so maybe uh, 60 or so. Uh, and then if you hit Shift-C, you can search through the tools in Cinema, and we're going to type in spline wrap. There it is. If we make the spline wrap a child of our cylinder, you can see the bounding box automatically jumps to its parent. And we can put our spline in here to immediately wrap our geometry along that spline. Now, it looks totally incorrect because by default, the axis of the spline wraps is set to x. And our cylinder is tall on the y axis. So we just need to switch this over to y. And now we have some spaghetti. And this is what we were after all along. Uh, the spline wrap has a cool function in here, this graph, which shows the size for the beginning and the end points. So uh, if we wanted it to be small at the start, we'd do that. You'd hold Control, add some more points. We could put lumps in it. Anyway, it's all lots of fun. Spline wrap's cool. You use it to make some tentacles. And uh, I apologize. The uh, buttons I hit didn't do what I expected them to do. But uh, let's go ahead and move on. I've got another example I want to show you. Uh, this one is from a project that I did for a company called Power. So I'll just go ahead and I'll play the video really quick, and then I'll talk about what uh, I wanted to show you. More uh, Rocket League car ball soccer. Very fun. In this specific project, um, I knew that I wanted this really cool shot in the middle where uh, some lightning goes up into the clouds. Um, and one thing that you could do, you know, if you had a lot of time or budget, is you could simulate some lightning. And you could get it as some geometry in your scene. You could make it maybe a mesh light or add an illumination material to it. So that way, it's flickering and it's branching actually affects your surrounding geometry. However, in this case, I knew that I wanted to get this done quickly. Uh, we were on a tight deadline, and I turned to stock footage. And the thing with stock footage is uh, you know, I download some lightning from Production Crate, and I don't know exactly what the stock footage is going to do. It's going to be brighter at this point and darker at this point, and you could go into your light settings and animate the intensity. Be like, OK, all right, frame zero, or obviously it's off, but on frame four, uh, it, OK, maybe it's a little brighter. And that's going to just be annoying, and it's not very flexible. Um, so what I did is I utilized uh, something called light groups uh, inside of Redshift. Uh, so that way, I could individually export different light passes all within the same render, save myself a bit of time. So I'll just show you how you can set that up in Redshift really quick. So I've got my scene here. Um, I've removed my VDBs just to keep it moving quickly. So let's go ahead and fire up our Redshift render view. Go to Redshift, render view, hit play. 
Let me give this just a moment. All right, so we've got our, uh, our scene in here. I've already got some lights set up. I've got some volumetrics. I apologize, it's a little bit hazy. Uh, but I've got this uh, yellow point light here, which is going to be the source of my lightning. If I enable this, you can see what that looks like. Uh, the main thing I don't want to do is bake this directly into the entire render. I want to be able to turn it on and off on the fly in After Effects. Uh, so I'm going to separate this out into its own light group and set up a custom AOV for, or not a custom AOV, a light group AOV for it. So we're going to select the light that we want isolated, come over here to the Details tab, and we're going to go to AOV Light Group. It's its own tab down here. And I'm just going to select Add New Light Group. It's going to ask for us to name this. I'll call this Lightning. Click OK. And uh, now our yellow light has been added to the Lightning AOV group. And uh, just for fun, I'm going to grab my other three, holding Shift. And we're going to add a new light group for these guys, too. I'll just call this uh, Base Lights. OK. So now we've got two different light groups. And if we switch our render view over to bucket mode, I'm pretty sure that we can see our light groups in action if this is going to render in any timely fashion. Nope, don't worry about it. It popped up last time, but it's fine. We're going to go to the render settings. And I'll show you where we need to go set up some AOV. So we'll go to Redshift. Uh, we're going to go to AOV. Uh, make sure really quick you're on the Advanced tab. So AOV, Show AOV Manager. And we need to drag out a Beauty Pass. Uh, the beauty pass is going to have over here on the right-hand side an option for your light groups. So I just like to check this all light groups option. I suppose if you had a lot and you only wanted a few of them, you could individually select these. Uh, but all light groups, and then we should be fine. And I did this in the wrong order. Uh, so now if we were to return to our render view, which I'll just show you really quick, uh, it should pop up. Yep, there they are. So I'll just give this a moment so we can see what it looks like in cinema before we pop over to After Effects. Um, I guess, for the sake of time, maybe we'll just uh, toggle the boxes you can see. So if we go to Base Lights, obviously there's no yellow. If we go to Lightning, there's our yellow. I do have this already imported into After Effects, so you can see what it looked like when it was finished rendering. So let me just open up that project really quick. Here is our render. What I have imported on my scene already is some uh, lightning from Production Crate. Looks pretty fun. Uh, and then what I have is my cloud light group. And this was from the original project where I rendered this out of. Uh, and then I have my stadium light group. So if we were to enable all of this all at once, this is kind of how it looks. And this might be how it looked if you baked the yellow light directly into your render. But fortunately, because we have these on separate passes, we can do some keyframe animation here to line it up with our lightning stock footage. So uh, say I'll just set this opacity to 0. By the way, you hit T on the keyboard, brings up opacity. Uh, so maybe I'll go right here to where we first see our lightning. I'll go back one frame using page up, make a keyframe. We'll go forward, set this to something like you know, 40%. Maybe go forward two frames to 100. It uh, looks like we're dying back down again. Uh, oh, this is a bright frame. This one's dimmer. Bright again. And uh, we're starting to fizzle back out. So I think if I'm right, there's one more. Yep, there's one more. I know the stock footage. OK, and we're off. I'm going to copy these keyframes to our cloud layer as well. And uh, if you take a look at what this looks like, uh, unlike the yellow being completely baked in, with the render, uh, we can now dynamically animate it to match whatever stock footage we might bring into our project. Um, this is a little reminder of what that final looked like. So I'm kind of doing a very similar thing. It's just a little less flickery. Um, I did this exact same thing on the Star Wars project. Um, I had some lightning in the sky, and I had a whole pass dedicated to ping some uh, yellow warm light off of these rocks, which is right here. Um, where's my pre-render? There it is. So you can see it's dark and it's light. We've got light you know, hitting these mountains up here. 
And uh, you can see it happening in the final as well when this lightning goes off in the sky. You can see it lighting up the geometry. And that's just because I stuck one big bright yellow light in the sky, I isolated it to its own light group, and then I keyframed animation the opacity in the composite when I placed my stock footage in there. So it's just a way to get a little extra integration and save yourself some render time. I also did it on this project here with this monster. Um, this one was a lot of fun uh, because I knew we were having this guy shoot at the monster. And I just put a big bright light pointing at his face. And I wanted it to be able to animate on and off per whatever muzzle flash might be composited. Um, simultaneously, this was a little more challenging, too, because there was a strobe light in our scene. So I had a bunch of different lights all around this that I was able to sort of mask and animate the opacity of. So the atmosphere always felt integrated, which is a lot of fun. We're all saving time over here. OK, the last thing I want to talk about, and uh, this is a little bit uh, of a different, oh, I already have it open. Check me out. All right. Um, this was a shot from a project that I did, which is another Rocket League esports related project. Um, and I do have a minute here, so I actually want to play this, if you don't mind, if you'll indulge me. Um, here it is. We'll stop it here. The rest of this is all gameplay. It's a cool edit. But if you're looking for Rocket League gameplay, um, I stream on Twitch weekdays at 7. So no, I'm just kidding. Um, I uh, have, yeah, some uh, boost trails going on in there. There was that shot where the car drifts around, and the boost comes out the back, and he jumps up into the air. And what we could have done is simulate some fire, but anybody who's used to simulations know that that can sometimes take hours or even days occasionally, depending upon how high quality you want it to be. I know there's some great tools out there, um, but I wanted to keep this fast as per the um, topic of the presentation and do it in particular. So in order to get a particular boost trail lined up with the back of this 3D render, uh, we're going to be using what's called a compositing file coming out of Cinema 4D and over into After Effects. Uh, anybody who hasn't used this, it's very handy. You can mark things for exports, such as pieces of geometry and nulls. And it'll give you the 3D animated position of those, as well as your camera. Um, and similar to how using the uh, Cinema 4D exporter from After Effects sets your project up for you in Cinema, right length, right resolution, right frame rate, uh, using the compositing file from Cinema does the same thing for you in After Effects. So we're kind of coming full circle. We're going back. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is stick a null right on the tail. So in order to do that, um, it's very similar to uh, what we were doing earlier, where uh, I'm going to select this. I'm going to hold Shift to make a null at that position. Um, find that null. I'm just going to call this Boost. And I'm going to slide my null back to roughly where the Boost tail is. Um, and if we scrub through this, obviously that null follows the car since it is a child. We held Shift. It became a child automatically. Less steps. It's working out fine. Uh, now we need to mark this for export. So we're going to right click on the boost. Uh, and we need to come over here to render tags. And there's something called an external compositing tag. And this is just going to tell Cinema that we want to be able to reference this in After Effects or whatever your compositor of choice, because there's a few export options. Um, and it's just going to mark that for export. So external compositing. Uh, I'm going to go look back through my camera here, make sure that looks all right. And then we're going to go to the render settings. And uh, if your output settings are all great, we've got my frame range set. We've got your resolution. Uh, you got a spot where you have saved this. You do have to set up a save path. Uh, you can come drop down at the very bottom the compositing project file. Um, check on save. Check your target application. Default it to After Effects, which is my software of choice. Uh, and then select Include 3D Data. And then you're going to hit Save Project File. Um, the type of project file this saves is called uh, a, a, an AEC file. 
um, which you need to have installed the Exchange plugin in After Effects. Uh, that comes free with Cinema 4D. Uh, it's just like a drag and drop type of thing. But once you save your AEC file, you can come on into After Effects. And I'll show you what it looks like when it's imported. OK. No sweat. We will just relink that really quick. I know where it is. Bear with me. We're a replace footage file. Uh, presentation resources. This was for Shopify. Uh, this was in renders, I'm pretty sure. Renders. We're doing it live. OK. This is what this shot looked like rendering without any uh, comping. And you can see I have a light animating to turn on right here, and that's where the boost starts. Um, when you import your project, your AEC file, excuse me, into After Effects, it's going to come with your camera. It's going to set up a composition that's already the right frame range. And it's going to come with any nulls or uh, pieces of geometry that you marked for export. And they're going to be already going to be pre-animated, which is very handy. So adding a particular source to this is actually very easy. Uh, the way to do that is first create a new solid, Control-Y. We're going to call this partic. Euler. It's important when you make a solid and call it particular, you spell it different each time. Um, then we're going to add the particular effect to it. Um, and particular is a very, very powerful effect. So it does take a minute to initialize. So we'll just give it a second here. Um, I really should have prepped some jokes. Or maybe it's better. We'll, say, we'll sit in some silence. Is this weird for you guys, too? Don't worry about it. OK, particular is loaded. Um, if we drop down the emitter here, uh, you can see there's this very handy function. And this was added a few updates ago, where we can just click Create Null. And this creates a null in our scene that the particles are already linked to. So if we, and this is a handy After Effects tip, uh, if you hold Shift when parenting something, it's going to move that null to its parent location uh, and just in a couple buttons, we already have some particles in the 3D spot that we wanted them to be in. So if we uh, go over here to the particular settings, I'm not going to talk too much about how you would make this into a boost trail, just since we're running low on time. But a couple buttons I might press are uh, changing this to directional, maybe giving it some additional velocity, and maybe uh, upping the particles per second. We would actually probably, whoop, that's a little high. I was trying to go for 500, but 5,003 was my faded number. Um, and we're just going to load here for a minute. And uh, particular has actually disappeared. Uh, the demo computer is out to get me today. No sweat. Um, well, I think you guys get the point. I am running a little bit low on time, so uh, I will conclude here, add a particular boost trail mark a uh, compositing file for export in Cinema 4D. And uh, yeah, those were all the examples I had for you guys today. This was really fun. That opening Action. shot was actually, uh, <laughs> it was actually a composite. Anyway, uh, my point of this whole thing is you don't have to do things perfectly, just as long as they look cool and your clients are happy. Uh, make the software work for you instead of you for the software. Uh, my name is Jacob Dalton, and uh, thank you guys very much for listening to me today. All right. Awesome. All right. <laughs> thank you. Hello. There we go. Hey, I'm back. Hi, everybody. So as in true NAB fashion, live audience gets priority. Internet, we always love you. They have questions. So let's see if you have better ones. Better questions than the Internet. Anthony, what do you got? Exactly. So the, so the question exactly. is, were you kit bashing or using Houdini? What were you doing for the clouds? So for the clouds, um, it was all, I think, from um, what's, that, what's that cool website that has all the Pixel VDBs? Lab? Pixel Lab. Thank yep. you. They were from shout Pixel Lab. Shout out to Jordan. Yes. Shout out to that guy. The, I love the Pixel Lab assets. They're all very cool. But yes, no, I, just, I bought a pack of VDBs, scattered them. Same for the Star Wars project that had all the clouds rendered in. Those are all from Pixel Lab as well. So save some time. Cutting some corners. Live questions. All right. Well, I think they know that you're going to be in the back for another hour, so they want to get that personalized one-on-one. -on -one. But Fair since enough. the internet can't, 
They do have questions. So, okay. uh, first question is, is there a creative planning process? Do you make storyboards? Do you go through that mm -hmm. whole thing? Or do you just start slapping stuff up there? Um, so, I'm, I'm very quick to just start slapping stuff together. Uh, if anybody works in eSports, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar that the timelines are sometimes outrageous, so you kind of just got to get it done. Uh, but I'm a big fan of making 3D storyboards. So just using primitives and viewport exports, putting together cuts in Premiere, making sure the client likes the vibe and the feel and the timing, and we can edit it down to music. Um, and then from there, I can go start replacing primitives with assets and texturing and lighting and so on. So you just start off with a rough previs, just using exactly. whatever assets that are, mm -hmm. just so you get the camera and flow. And mm -hmm. I jump right into Cinema 4D to start ideating. So I'm like, all right, the first shot could be, uh, how about this? All right, fun, moving on. And we Boom. just kind of jam through it. Love it. Uh, someone mentioned, I think this is one of our own. Hi, Michael. He's wondering, um, Red Giant stuff. So would you go over some of the Red Giant stuff you used in the composite for the Star Wars shot? So what, what are the, your go-to tools in that? Um, I really love the, um, like the, I use like the Knoll Light Factory. Okay. Um, I really like that one. There's a chromatic displacement. Yes. I'm a really big fan of, so I did that a lot on some of the motion. There was some like shockwave stuff, like when the Sith hits the X-Wing. I use the chromatic displacement to sort of go booge and give it some power. A um, lot of particular in that one, uh, just for some like atmosphere. It felt like we were flying through in the sky. Um, when he strikes the X-Wing and there's like a, um, a smoke trail coming out the back, all particular. Um, and a particular and a particular and particular. <laughs> Lots of particular. All right. Um, somebody's wondering where you got your stock footage from. Were you using stock footage or just uh, VDBs? Uh, well, if he means stock assets, like yeah. the lightning, um, I get it a lot from, obviously, like Video Copilot, Action Essentials. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. That's a great resource. The but good stuff. Production Crate as well okay. is a really good spot to quickly grab some stuff. They have, like, I feel like a niche category. It's not necessarily an isolated category, but it feels more... Um, the quality that would align with a video game cinematic. Uh, so versus Style. like filmed stuff, okay. it can feel more like it's meant to exist in a 3D rendered environment that's not necessarily intended to be photo real. Uh, so I, I love their stuff. They got a big variety. Very cool. And see, to export the light groups, was the entire sequence exported as an EXR? Oh, yes. I totally breezed past that. That's a wonderful question. Um, I did mark it for a multi-pass export with uh, OpenEXR, which is like my go-to format for exporting out 3D sequences. I'll do them in 32-bit. I usually comp in 16-bit, but it'll allow me to do like pre-renders with like if I want to change the exposure in post. Yeah. So I'm all about like ultimate flexibility. EXR, folks. All right. Um, the lightning stock footage, was that from Production Crate as well? Yes, lightning oh, from Production Crate. All right. Um, would you be able to do the same thing importing the null through Cineware? Um, I, would, uh, I would assume so, but that has uh, not been my workflow for doing it. I've always enjoyed exporting out compositing files because it sets up that composition for me. The full, yeah, uh -huh. you already have everything, yep. pre-comps and all that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, did you make the sound effects and music? That is a one that's going to make my friend very happy. No, uh, a lot of the music is like either stock and edited. Um, some of it's custom, and all of the sound effects um, are a mix. Uh, same with the music of like pre-bought stuff or custom-made stuff. But it's all done by my friend uh, Chris Lorick. He's like my go-to sound guy. Uh, so uh, Shout out to Chris. Yes, he, he does all that for me. I do all the 3D, and then I hand it to him for sound design, and he jams that out. So awesome. I love working with him. And uh, do you have any C4D, uh, do you have any 4D tutorials on a channel? Uh, I do not. I am... Uh, Cineversity is a great place that has tutorials. No, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll try, try and get you back, yes. um, and as well as training, because I'm sure there's a lot of the Red Giant stuff, the stuff that you missed here. Mm -hmm. We would love to have you back. Simon, I'm sure you'd like to have him on the show. Oh, I got a thumbs up from Simon. So we'd love to just uh, have you uh, share more with the community if you'd cool. be up for that. I would absolutely love to. I try and make time for doing that type of stuff. I used to, but my, uh, my YouTube channel is all After Effects tutorials. So you're welcome to check that out. It's Jacob Dalton VFX. But uh, I, the last one I posted was like four years ago. We're going to make wow. time for more, though, yeah. and I'd love to do it with you yeah, guys. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely work it out. <laughs> so let's give Jacob another round of applause. Thank you.
And if you enjoyed some of the Red Giant stuff, you're going to be in for a real treat because up next is our very own action movie dad, Hashi. So stay tuned for Hashi.